Hello everyone, welcome to the inaugural episode of Samurai Gaiden, our new series where we will talk about uh, stories and anecdotes of the men and women of medieval Japan and the events that shape their lives. As promised, our debut episode is going to center around Ashikaga Yoshitaru, the Kengo Shogun. Uh, Yoshitaru was the 13th Ashikaga Shogun of Japan, and he's largely regarded as the last true Shogun of the Warring States era. Uh, he was an aristocrat, a nobleman, but he was also a warrior and a diplomat. He exemplified a lot of the facets that the samurai envisioned themselves to exemplify. <clears throat> Yoshitaru's father was forced out of the capital and forced to uh, abdicate his throne in favor of his 11-year-old son, Yoshitaru, uh, which basically made him a puppet, much like his father. His father was a puppet that grew a little too powerful, and the forces that be decided, mm, an 11-year-old is easier to control than a 30-year-old. So they forced his father out of the capital, installed him on the throne. A few years pass, and Yoshitaru decides, you know, my father was trying to restore the power of the shogunate, but he made mistakes, he was careless. I'll be more careful. <coughs> Yoshitaru started a campaign of diplomacy that reinstalled the authority of the shogunate. Centuries ago, they had been the premier force in Japan that ruled the government. And now they were figureheads, and he wanted to change that. Ironically, the Shogun uh, was often in the same battle with the Emperor, because centuries ago, the Emperor had been the power of Japan, but he had given away power to the Sei Tai Shogun, the Shogun, and at different periods and times, the Emperor tried to take control of Japan back. Uh, eventually did, Emperor Meiji, uh, at the end of the Tokugawa uh, shogunate. But Yoshitaru was, as I said, he was called the Kengo Shogun because he was a master swordsman. <coughs> and everybody at the time knew this. Uh, the daimyo, the liege lord of Japan, who tried to uh, win over his support, or that whose support he tried to win over by negotiating with them. Uh, they liked to give him uh, great swords, which this was a common thing to give to, you know, another samurai or a kuge, to, you know, be a good gift. Figure when your whole society uh, reveres the fact of the warrior class, giving another member of the warrior class a great weapon is a pretty good gift. <clears throat> By this period, the shogunate was relatively poor financially and manpower-wise. However, Yoshitaru realized that he still had his title. And even though he was a puppet behind the Hosokawa and later the Miyoshi powers, he still had that title, that authority, simply of... I have a name that means something. And with that, he started gathering supporters by offering that name on loan, basically. Uh, as I said, his name was Ashikaga Yoshitaru. Uh, and he gave that character, Teru, to a lot of men to either take for themselves or for their sons. Uh, Mori Terumoto, uh, Nagao Teru Toro, uh, better known as Wasugi Kenshin, uh, Date Terumune, all of these men you know, took a character of his name, Teru, and that basically made him like a godfather to them. <clears throat> uh, this secured power for him, however, these daimyo who were ostensibly loyal to him weren't immediately around him. Uh, by the time he took power as shogun, we were starting to get towards the Miyoshi's uh, apex, 
And as I said, Yoshiteru was trying to reinstall Shogun of Power. This didn't sit well with his puppet masters, the Miyoshi, and to uh, arguably lesser extent, the Matsunaga. Uh, Matsunaga Hisahide was a vassal of the Miyoshi, but was arguably just as powerful as them. Uh, when Yoshiteru started becoming more open about his intentions to make the Shogun the real authority again, uh, Miyoshi and the Matsunaga decided that, once again, as they decided with his father, why have a 30-year-old in charge when we can have an 11-year-old? They decided, why have Yoshiteru in charge when we can have his nephew, his cousin, his third uncle twice removed, whatever. As long as it was someone who was considered to be easier to control. That's what you want in a puppet. When the puppet starts talking back, it's probably time for the asylum for you. Or in this case, time to kill the puppet and move on to the next one. However, just blatantly attacking the Shogun, especially one who has been so active in diplomacy, he negotiated a peace treaty uh, between the Mori and their enemies, he negotiated numerous other peace treaties, he's been giving his name away to people, all these powerful lords who surround the lords that surround him and control him are now on his side. So just blatantly attacking him can be quite a gamble. So they start to weasel his power away, and he fights back against that. And that's where Matsunaga Hisahide comes in. Matsunaga is a shadowy man. He very shady. He doesn't understand the meaning of the word honor. <clears throat> and he decides, nah, let's just blatantly do this. <clears throat> so Matsunaga and members of the Yoshi surround Yoshitero at his palace in Nijo. Uh, at this stage, it's the Shogunal Palace. However, it's not nearly as grandiose as it is today or as it was in later uh, times. At this stage, it's basically just a wall of mansions, much like any other house. It's just a nice one. <clears throat> but they surround it. They've got thousands of troops. Yoshitaru has 200. Those are his bodyguard. They're not going to hold out for long, is the anticipation. Yoshitaru sends out messengers to the, you know, uh, to the Takeda, the Masugi, the Mori, the Rokaku, the Oda, all of these men who have ostensibly sworn fealty to him, say, hey, I'm under attack, come save me. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Matsunaga and the Miyoshi fear that this might come true, so they do that blatant attack. They attack Nijo Palace. They send spearmen in to just kill everybody. And this is part of the reason why Yoshitaru is known so widely for his swordsmanship. Because, what I said earlier, a lot of lords have been giving him these great quality swords. And he's got a wall filled with them. <clears throat> and he decides to fight back. He's not just going to commit seppuku, he's going to fight back. So he pulls one of the swords off the wall, and when the spearmen come in, he's had his men lift up the tatami mats and stack them. So the spearmen have to come through these channels. They can't just come blatantly in and start thrusting and slashing. They're funneled in through all these little holes, which Yoshitaru and his men then hack them to pieces. So, okay, okay. Spearmen won't work, so we'll send in swordsmen. So the swordsmen come in. Well, one-on-one, -on -one, they're funneled through these little channels too, but one-on-one, -on -one, Yoshitaru is able to just destroy anything that the Matsunaga and Miyoshi send in. Uh, they can't use archers on him because he's in the building. They get caught in the roof, not doing anything. <clears throat> the spearmen, the swordsmen, all these warriors are sending in, and Yoshitaru is wrecking them horribly. Uh, in the battle, he's regarded as having broken or dull to the point of uselessness numerous swords. Some accounts stipulate more than a dozen swords that he either shattered on the enemy or cut so many of them that it, the blade was dull to the point of not using. 
And every time he would break one, or he would get one stuck in somebody, or he would dull it to uselessness, he would go to the wall, he would grab another one, because he had plenty of them. This is the story that Taki Shingen gave me. Well, that one's broke. How about the one that Wasuki Kenshin gave me? Eh, that's stuck in a guy's ribs. Well, how about this one that Oda Nobunaga gave me? Well, let's cut a few heads off with this. <clears throat> I've seen some estimates that he may have killed upwards of 30 soldiers just in his own. Keep in mind, he also had 200 men. Now, it could have been that he killed four guys. Who knows? It could have been that he killed 40. Who knows? Because... In the next stage of the battle, the Matsunaga and Miyoshi realize we may eventually win this because it's 2,000 against 200 and we have more troops in reserve, but we also have to remember that he sent out messengers for reinforcements. We've got to end this quickly. And he's killing us. A lot. And real easy. At the same time, Yoshitono knows that he can't leave his palace. As soon as he leaves, he'll be cut down by archers. So, Matsunaga figures out, well, Let's send the archers after all, with flaming arrows. They send the archers forward, they fire flaming arrows, catch the whole palace on fire. Yoshitero realizes it's over. <clears throat> he can't survive the fire, clearly. He's not the Human Torch. He's the Kengo Shogun. He can't leave the palace. He'll be killed by the archers. So, he writes a final poem, as is common, of the samurai. And he commits seppuku. Yoshitiro's final poem he wrote in waka form, what was a common uh, form of poetry, waka. Uh, <clears throat> in English, the rough translation is The May Rain Falls, and it is my tears or the mist that surround me. Hotogisu, take my name and soar above the clouds. Showing that he had grand ambitions. However, unfortunately, he was killed before he was able to make those ambitions come true. Not an uncommon aspect of samurai life, especially one so tragic as Yoshiteru, who was well respected in his time, well respected in modern times. However, it was just luck of the draw. Much as it was luck of the draw, he was born into the shogunal families. Had he been born out in the outliers as uh, you know, samurai to become daimyo, he may have done, you know, he may have been one of the great unifiers, like Oda Nobunaga, Toyokomi Hideyoshi. But stuck in the middle of everything, couldn't escape it, and wasn't able to get the power base he needed to expand from. Well, I've got you. Uh, kind of forgot to mention in Yoshitero's poem, he says, uh, Hotogisu, take my name and soar above the clouds. The Hotogisu is a type of bird. It's the lesser cuckoo. Uh, Cuculus polyocephalus. Uh, it's a bird. Uh, however, the kanji Hotogisu that they use to write the bird's name it also means never to return. Uh, it has certain spiritual significance to guiding spirits to the next realm or something around you know, around that aspect. Uh, so in case you were curious what Hotogisu meant in his poem, since I read the rest of it in English, uh, basically he said, uh, Hey, Cougar Bird, take my name and soar above the clouds. <laughs>